Welcome to the first of a series of films looking at the issue of abnormal clotting pathology in long COVID, and yes, the notorious microclots. In this episode, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to internal medicine specialist Dr. Yaku Laubscher about his take on the pathophysiology at play. He'll discuss his views on why the clots are created and just how they cause havoc. He's worked closely with Professor Rezia Pretorius and treated hundreds of long haulers, as well as those suffering from acute COVID early in the pandemic, so has plenty of on-hand experience. In the films to come, we'll be talking to both Professor Rezia Pretorius and Professor Doug Kell about the latest research on the topic, and we'll be coming back to Dr. Laubscher to discuss exactly how he treats the condition. But for now, let's dive in. Uh, Yaku, thank you so much for spending the time to have a bit of a chat with us on this subject. I was wondering, um, for the people who aren't maybe familiar with your sort of pathway in medicine, if you could just sort of fill us in on a what what's brought you to this point in terms of your career so far? Look, I'm a specialist physician. Right. So main interest, I think, it's, it's funny, it's many years ago, 20 years, I said, I'm, I'm doing vascular biology. Right. And that's exactly what we're doing now, you know, so I've got, you know, obviously, main interest, cardiology, hypertension, diabetics, cholesterol, Sort of the usual stuff that that internal medicine, you know, and you. We've been working on blood, you know, as a sideline. I'm not a I'm not a, a researcher. I'm a clinician, you know. Uh, and this thing came along, and you know, I, I sort of couldn't help it. It's probably a good point to ask you how SARS-CoV-2 affects clotting in the body. Very simple. It's not complicated. It it's in the end an endothelial disease. If you don't understand that, you'll end up with all sorts of pathways going all around, you know, be it inflammation, be it mast cells, be it whatever. It's endothelial damage. Obviously, the, the endothelium contains the ACE receptor to which the spike uh, protein of the virus binds and to infect it and to damage it. So then you have to look at, you know, one of the functions, obviously, of endothelium is to prevent clotting. So as long as you've got intact endothelium, uh, the platelets and clotting factors don't act up. The moment you get endothelial damage, you get exposure of underlying uh, tissue factors from villebrands that, you know, they're they proteins. They, they activate platelets to, to activate and the enzymatic pathway of clotting to form a clot to heal the original injury. And that's where, you know, one of the problems starts that, the damage to the endothelium because of the virus is so widespread that the body's ability to maintain normal clotting physiology fails. And therefore, you get widespread areas of exposed endothelium. You get continuous activation of platelets, of the enzymatic pathway of clotting to form these microclots. And together with the endothelial damage, in the end, you have a problem with oxygen transfer on a localized tissue level. And oxygen is needed for the battery of the cell, the mitochondria. Mitochondria is not getting oxygen, it's not working. And you need that energy you know, to maintain all normal metabolic processes. And there's a very interesting thing now. So if you know, not, not all organs in the body has got the same partial pressure of oxygen under normal circumstances. So the lung sits as the highest, you know, sits at, at 100 to 110 millimeters mercury because you inhale oxygen. The brain sits at 35. So the brain is very sensitive to hypoxemia and the brain, skin, muscle, eye, femur, placenta are the organs in the body and probably vestibular. The study I read, they didn't test the vestibular system, but I'm pretty sure That'll be pretty low as well. That's where all the symptoms of COVID comes from, long COVID. So, um, you know, in the end, you can do whatever you want. You need to fix the endothelium. The rest will follow. And, you know, there's no drug that fixes endothelium, really. But what we do know is there, and that's what we've developed with Rezia uh, and Douglas Kell, that the, the, the ability to show up these microclots um, and once you've seen it, you know, and, and you realize what's happening, uh, you can't help it but, but treat it. And, and you need to manage, you need to control the clotting, the failed clotting physiology. That gives the, the opportunity, the slight opportunity for the endothelium to yield. And as you know yourself, it takes a hell of a lot, long time sometimes. You know? Months. 
so are there are there particular symptom clusters that are associated with sort of this sort of clotting pathology in your opinion yaku absolutely everything is due to the 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 failed clotting oxygen transfer in the end everything the the, the forget for the, if you look at the brain fog you know, it's a vague some in vague sort of uh, complex of symptoms but in, essentially it means um impaired memory word finding is an issue simple mathematics is an issue sleep disturbance headaches um uh, planning organization uh you know especially the i've got a few artists they can't paint anymore they can't design ceramics they so that's that's basically brain fog and then obviously you go down to the muscle uh, the fatigue the post post exertional fatigue i you know i've got a little bit of a theory there but i think that's pretty much what happens so let's say overnight typically the, the symptoms are fluctuating it comes and goes sometimes patients say well i feel better today and four hours later they crash and you know need to go to bed for six hours so it's like overnight you go to bed you sleep you go down to basic metabolic rate for your brain your muscles are not working so you sort of build up a little reservoir of oxygen the morning you wake up you feel i'm fresh i can actually tackle the day your brain starts working you go for a 200 meter walk you use up that little reservoir and normally you would have get you would have had normal oxygen transfer like happens every day but in covid because of that endothelial damage it's not happening so the mitochondria fails the patient crashes he needs to go lie down for 4 hours there's obviously degrees of it it's not everybody's severely affected but that's the muscle the, the, the exertional uh, post exertional malaise clearly the palpitations very interesting that's patients are being labeled as pots they don't have pots and i'll explain to you why so if pots is autonomic dysfunction there's nothing wrong with your autonomic nervous system but patients complain of this crazy heart rate you they sit up for 5 minutes the heart rate is 140 or they go for a minor walk and it's 180 type of thing so this is sort of blood pressure control 101 you know it's it's sort of like baroreceptors in the in the carotids uh, feedback to the brain stem from the brain stem uh, autonomic nervous system so on the one hand blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance so if you want to increase your your blood pressure your sympathetic nervous system uh, stimulates the heart you get an increased heart rate but i think more importantly you need the peripheral resistance the peripheral resistance is caused by muscular you know medium sized arteries mainly and that message via the autonomic nervous system is related relayed by a healthy endothelium if the endothelium doesn't give the message those arteries can't contract so the only thing left is for the sympathetic nervous system to hit the heart with adrenaline and you get this extreme high heart rate to try and maintain blood pressure so it's it's not autonomic failure it's endothelial failure and that's of course one of the really good tests as far as i'm concerned for long covid uh, is endothelial functional test testing that you either do with a brachial artery flow mediated dilatation or uh, this fancy endopath system that does basically the same it's also flow mediated uh, and and these patients are sitting at you know normal dilatation 30% these patients are sitting at 7% 12% 1% it's terrible you know and so it's not pots it's endothelial failure so i guess what you're saying is that there isn't an intrinsic autonomic nervous system problem but it's no. secondary to the endothelial failure but i guess it would be fair to say that the clinical syndrome that is resulting can looks like fulfill the diagnostic criteria for pots it which looks is like elevated pot. Yeah. But you can drink um, as much fluid. You can drink as much fluid as you want. It's not going to fix it. Yeah, and that's certainly been my experience. To be honest, when you mentioned the test to test endothelial function, what does it take to get hold of one of those tests? How how are those tests performed? Where are they available? And you know why aren't why aren't our long COVID clinics in the UK routinely putting patients through them? Look I think you first have to accept that that the, the disease is endothelial dysfunction then you can start thinking how are we going to test it so you know I think I'm not sure why this is but there's 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 this complete reluctance to accept that this is the problem people are looking for viral persistence 
all sorts of other things, you need to fix the endothelium. Um, so it's not a difficult test. It's not, I don't think it's expensive. Um, you know, I've got a, a technologist that does my echo and vascular stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's very simple to do it. The end of that is just a refined, um, you know, apparatus to do the, give you the same answer. But it's basically ultrasound testing of, of a brachial artery flow before and after occlusion of, of the radial artery, sort of distal occlusion. It sounds a bit funny, but that's technically how it works. It takes literally 10, 12 minutes um, and, and you get a number immediately. It's, it's, it's not difficult. Look, it's not, a, it's not a test that's commonly done in, in clinical medicine. It's not something we use every day. But for this disease, I think it's one of the top markers to say you've got it or you, or you don't. So if, you know, everybody, what I want to sort of be able to give people out there who are struggling, who are meeting resistance all over the place, tests coming back normal, what kind of doctor can they go and see who might be able to do something like this and would listen constructively to a suggestion that it might be a good idea yep. to try it? Um, I think vascular surgeons, cardiologists, um, uh, and, and radiologists that does ultrasound, you know, vascular work, ultrasound wise, yeah. it's not a difficult test, really. Um, and as I say, it takes 10 minutes, it's done. It's objective and it's there. It's, it's black and white. You know, it's not like a little gray area. It's, it's, it's a definite test. A huge thanks to Dr. Labsha for his time in talking to us. In the next film in the series, we're going to be talking to Professors Rezia Pretorius and Doug Kell, who, if you weren't aware, um, were the authors of a series of papers on the topic and were the first to actually discover these notorious microclots in the blood. So that's going to be very exciting. And then we'll be coming back to Dr. Labsher to discuss how he treats the condition and what the role of anticoagulants or blood thinners might be and just how safe they are. So until then, look after yourselves. Until next time.